Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Danny Berger is across the river in New Jersey once again today. In fact, at the Elizabeth Marina with 45,000 dock workers now on strike. Now, Danny brought us up to date on the stakes yesterday, and she's back with us at the port here to bring us up to date on what has transpired since midnight. Danny, we learned a lot from your reporting yesterday. And we're hearing estimates in the $4 billion a day range here for the cost of this strike. What are you learning? Well, Joe, it does seem like we are inching ever closer to a deal. To be clear, we are not there yet. Conversations happened into the 11th hour of this strike. So just to give you an idea of where we were at this time yesterday, it was the International Longshoremen's Association, the union, demanding a 77% pay increase over the next six years. We have got an offer from USMX, that is the United States Marine Association. They say that they are willing to pay 50 percent over the next six years. It seems like the other side has come down too. The union now says that they are willing to accept 61 and a half percent. So getting closer. We are still not there yet, Joe. And one of the other sticking points continues to be automation. Uh, we heard from the employer saying that they would keep the current language in the contract about automation, which does prevent it from going forward. Is that enough? That is still a question. Okay. Now, I'm glad you mentioned that because automation is a little bit more difficult to quantify. What would that look like in a deal, in a form that would make the dock workers happy? Well, the dock workers want it banned in all forms of any of it being added, whether it be autonomous or semi-autonomous. Joe, this issue really goes back to the summertime. There was in Alabama, it appeared to be that some of the docks were using automated technology for unloading, which at the time the workers said violated the contract. That's part of the reason why today's talks, why yesterday's talks have gotten so contentious. They basically say any move forward on automation, they do not want. They do not want the post the posts here on the east, on the Gulf Coast, to look like it does in Asia or Amsterdam. They, again, just want it stalled at its current level. Many say that that's not possible, but maybe you need upskilling. You need different things to help folks keep their job, even if that automation does take place. Understood. We spoke last evening, Danny, with the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, specifically asked him about contingency plans, knowing how much uh, we're talking about here in terms of an economic impact, the number of uh, ships that pass through these ports and the containers uh, that they are carrying. Here's what he said about contingency plans, knowing that this strike is now in effect. I had another convening uh, that uh, my colleagues at DOT uh, brought together with about 60 different players across uh, logistics and supply chains to make sure that we're mapping uh, everything and anything that needs to happen in terms of adjustments or flexibilities uh, across uh, road, rail, uh, and uh, different ports across the United States. But certainly, uh, the best thing that could happen is for uh, the parties to quickly come to terms. And it sounds like, Danny, they might do that based on what you're telling us here. The conversations are still underway, but as long as this strike is in place, what do we know about our ability to reroute shipments to try to make up for the loss of activity on the East Coast? Well, Joe, the best plans and the ones that were already put in place were ones that basically front ran this. And we did indeed see that there were record shipments coming into these United States before the strike because we knew about this date. We knew that October 1st would come and the contract would run out. So that is one method that a lot of really urgent type materials that needed to come into the U.S. did. They extended the hours of all the ports. Mm -hmm. When it comes to reroute, Joe, the options are not good. The West Coast can only handle some 16% of what comes through the East Coast. In Canada, they can't handle much. Same goes for Mexico. There's the possibility of air traffic, air freights, but their capacity isn't great either. It's much less than the coast, and so many people are ordering via e-commerce that those are mostly booked up. So for now, the administration needs to hope that the plans that they already put in place are enough and that they resolve quickly, like you heard there from Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Bloomberg's Danny Berger, an absolute authority on this story and with us from the marina in elizabeth new jersey danny thank you so much for a second day of coverage here of course this all began at 12:01 a.m it was a midnight deadline 
and we have passed it. I want to add the voice of Seth Harris, of course, someone we talk to a lot about all issues, including labor, and this is a precarious moment for the administration. And of course, on the campaign trail, a new item, another reason to be talking about organized labor in this cycle. Seth is senior fellow at the Burns Center for Social Change at Northeastern University and was one of Joe Biden's top uh, labor advisors, former U.S. Deputy Secretary of Labor. Seth, it's great to have you back. The big picture here, is this about pay and benefits or is it about automation? It's about both, Joe. Um, the, the union feels very strongly and its members are quite angry about the fact that the companies earned a Mount Everest of profits hmm. during the pandemic. They are still highly profitable uh, and the workers want their fair share. The workers worked through the pandemic. They put themselves at grave risk. Uh, they want a fair share of those profits. And the only way to do that is with higher wages and with better benefits. Automation is about job protection. They want to make sure that they're not going to lose their jobs and the union is not going to lose members over time. So they have fairly strong automation language in their existing contract, but automation is always changing. Technology is always changing. So they want to strengthen that language to make sure that we're not going to see meaningful displacement of longshore workers. Uh, we know that Joe Biden has chosen not to invoke the Taft-Hartley Act. Seth, he could have demanded an 80-day cooling off period under that law. We know that the president has been open to these ideas with what we saw, of course, in the rail strike two years ago. Are you surprised he did not do this? And, and what does that tell us about the administration's posture here? No, I'm not surprised at all. You know, in, in seeking an injunction in court to shut down a strike mm. takes power out of workers' hands. And Joe Biden's entire presidency has been about putting more power into workers' hands. So I'm, I'm not surprised at all. The, the National Freight Rail strike and also to some extent the West Coast negotiations, the West Coast dock worker negotiations occurred in a different period in our history when supply chains were extremely vulnerable and there was a grave risk of lasting damage to the economy. Well, supply chains have healed. They're doing just fine. This is certainly going to have a, the strike will have a, a an economic effect if it goes on for a good long time. But I don't think supply chain infrastructure is going to be damaged by really? the strike. And the president sees it that way as well. Well, that's really important, Seth. Maybe you can tell our viewers and listeners a little bit more on the why, because there are a lot of bad and recent memories about these supply chain hiccups going through COVID. We finally unsnarled so many of these lines that people are worried that we're going to go back into another inflationary period. The Christmas gifts aren't going to show up on time. and We see this whole movie all over again. How is it different now? Well, remember what happened during the pandemic. Uh, Americans stopped buying or slowed dramatically the buying of services, right? We weren't going out for meals. We weren't going out to the movies. We weren't going out to bowl. Uh, instead, what we did is we spent a tremendous amount of money on goods. And so a large amount of goods were coming into the United States. At the same time, workforces around the world were being affected by COVID. There were people who were sick and dying. There were people who were not able to go into work. There were people who had caregiving responsibilities and weren't able to work. And so the system just was not working well. The, the, the private sector folks who run our supply chains just were totally and completely unprepared and didn't have contingencies. They had stripped their systems down mm. in order to maximize profit. We're not there anymore. We're, you know, we don't have people who are out because of COVID. We don't have people who have child care responsibilities or elder care responsibilities unable to go to work. We have people whose work is being slowed down or stopped because of a strike. And when the strike ends, they'll be able to get back to work. Now, that is the strike ending is not going to immediately solve every problem. We're going to end up with a big backlog of cargo that has to come into the United States. Yep. And for every week of strike, It'll take three or four weeks to get the cargo moving again. OK, you might not be surprised to hear that Speaker Mike Johnson sees this differently than the Biden administration. He's out with a statement that says just one day of paused operations will have devastating consequences on the economy and hardworking American families will feel the impact of higher prices, empty shelves, lost economic output. He's criticizing the administration here, Seth, for making life harder for everyone, he says, and the failure to encourage a resolution between uh, the Longshoremen's Association Union and the U.S. Maritime Alliance will exacerbate economic pain. This is what we're going to hear in the debate tonight from J.D. Vance, right? 
Well, that's an interesting problem that the Republicans have. Let me just say Mike Johnson is about as anti-union as you can be. So that's an easy position for him to take. Hmm. But the, the Trump Vance ticket has a little bit of a challenge here because President Trump tries to build on the constructive ambiguity in his career about his relationship with workers and his relationship with unions. He doesn't want to be perceived as a rabidly anti-union guy, even given the record of his administration, was, which was quite anti-union. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he goes on with Elon Musk on Twitter spaces, he sometimes lets his real inner Trump out. But uh, J.D. Vance is in a difficult position because he is trying to portray himself and also his presidential candidate as friends of the working person, friends of unions, people who want workers to have power. So if you're going to shut down a strike and take power out of workers' hands, you have a lot of explaining to do. So I think uh, J.D. Vance absolutely is going to attack President Biden and Vice President Harris by extension because mm -hmm. there is a strike. I'm sure uh, Governor Waltz will defend them. But taking a position on what they would do, I think that's going to be pretty perilous. Well, when you consider this action, and I don't know how long you think this is going to go on for, Seth, you add Boeing, there are questions about whether we're going to have, you know, a hot labor winter here, just as people are getting ready to vote and, and get to the polls. What does it say about the administration, which, of course, has framed itself as the most union friendly in American history, to find ourselves with two more labor actions walking up against this election? Well, strikes are not failures. Strikes are not a sign either that the White House has failed or the collective bargaining has failed. They are a part of the collective bargaining process. And President Biden has been absolutely clear about this. The whole idea in collective bargaining is that private parties, management and labor, sit down at the table and work out their problems. And government doesn't have a role except to mediate and to try to keep the parties at the table. That's what's good about it. It's not a government solution. So the fact that the Boeing workers were unhappy with the amount of money that was offered to them by management, and justifiably so, and that the longshore workers are worried about their jobs mm -hmm. and want to get more, sh a bigger share of the profits that their employers are getting, that's all part and parcel of a collective bargaining process. It's like democracy. It's not always pretty, but it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you want to shut it down and force people to work. Got it. Seth, I'm glad you could join us today. Do you have a sense, by the way? We're, I've got 30 seconds left. I don't want to cut you off, but are we talking days or weeks? I th I think the move by USMX to raise their wage offer is a very good sign. Mm. The ILA responded by lowering their wage offer. I think that we could be looking at a deal in the next week, week and a half. Really appreciate that. And that's coming from an expert. Seth Harris, great to see you. As always, Senior Fellow of the Burns Center for Social Change at Northeastern University. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We want to go to the spin room floor here in New York now, where Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall is there as preparations are underway for the big event, which kicks off just about seven and a half hours from now this evening. Tyler, the Middle East probably going to be more forefront on the agenda of, of questions and topics the candidates will have to address than it would have been prior to today. Exactly. And, you know, we've already seen former President Trump put out a statement kind of pushing forward this idea that if he was president, maybe this wouldn't have happened. So it will be interesting to see how the two candidates kind of thread that needle tonight. Right. We expect wall out. Oh. To, we expect Senator J.D. Vance to kind of toe that line, support Trump on that. And then, of course, we have we know that Vice President Kamala Harris is now in the Situation Room watching this closely and what Governor Tim Walls can tell us from the Democratic, the Democratic base's point of view when it comes to handling this issue. There's no doubt that foreign policy now is going to take center stage here tonight. That's for sure. You're in the spin room uh, there, of course, Tyler. We're going to be hearing from surrogates uh, from both candidates this evening. Yep, definitely. The spin room is already starting to fill up with journalists. We haven't really seen any surrogates quite yet because this is, you know, the first and likely the only debate between these vice presidential candidates. It's also likely the last debate of this presidential cycle, which is just raising these stakes even higher because, as you both know, we are exactly 
five weeks away from Election Day. So we are expecting the surrogates to come out as both of the campaigns kind of have this last push to appeal to voters. And we are talking about foreign policy. We are also expecting domestic policy to take center stage tonight. As you both know, both of these running mates were chosen in part due to their Midwest roots and how they can kind of appeal to some of the more industrial Midwestern voters in some key battleground states that our Bloomberg News Morning Console poll has been following. Uh, for a sense of the messaging that we might expect, we actually pulled this bite from Senator J.D. Vance at the Republican National Convention earlier this summer. It's about all of us, and it's about who we're fighting for. It's about the auto worker in Michigan wondering why out-of-touch politicians are destroying their jobs. It's about the factory worker in Wisconsin who makes things with their hands and is proud of American craftsmanship. Now you heard him mention Michigan and Wisconsin there. Those are two of the seven key battleground states that we watch in our Bloomberg News Morning Console poll. I'd point you to the most recent iteration out last week, which shows Vice President Kamala Harris leading former President Trump among likely voters in those seven key battleground states by about three percentage points. So a very, very close race here. Now we play J.D. Vance, I'll say for Waltz's part, he's often billed as somebody with this quote Midwest sensibility. That's a line that the Harris campaign often uses. So we'll be watching closely tonight to see how both of these candidates appeal to these voters in some key battleground states, including perhaps pushing some more protectionist or populist viewpoints. All right, Tyler Kendall reporting for Bloomberg from the spin room at the site of tonight's vice presidential debate. Tyler, thank you so much. We'll keep tabs with Tyler as we make our way closer to special coverage that starts at 8 p.m. Eastern time. The debate begins at 9 and we'll have the full simulcast for you here on Bloomberg TV and radio. Not too far from where Kaylee and I are right now, the CBS Broadcast Center on West 57th Street will become the center of the political universe a short time from now. Kaylee, it's time to assemble our panel. We haven't gotten to Rick and Jeannie on such a busy day uh, until right now. Of course, Bloomberg Politics contributors Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University, and Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital. Jeannie, this is a test, of course, for the Biden administration, and Kamala Harris is part of it. She is in the Situation Room right now with Joe Biden, and I wonder the way you're kind of looking at this as a political opportunity or liability uh, for a member of this administration. It's also a chance for her to appear presidential today, right? It is, and and you just took the words right out of my mouth, Joe. I was going to say test. It's a test for Kamala Harris. It's also a test for J.D. Vance and a test for Tim Waltz. Of all the things I'm sure that Tyler was just talking about that they've prepared for tonight, I am not sure that they spend as much time, say, on foreign policy as they would have on the economy, immigration, and some of those other issues. So this is going to be a test for them. And I would just say we already know where Donald Trump is on this. He has issued a statement on Truth Social saying that the Harris-Biden campaign and administration are leading us to World War III and have left us less safe. And of course, you've got the president saying what we expect to hear from Tim Waltz and Kamala Harris when she does talk, that Israel has every right to defend itself vigorously and the U.S. will do everything it can to protect Israel. So those are sort of, I think, what we might hear tonight. What I hope we would hear is a little bit more policy specifics on the Middle East, but We'll have to see if we get there tonight. Yeah, and of course, as we consider the policy specifics and what Americans are looking to hear from these candidates, there is a question, Rick, to what extent they want insight on foreign policy or they're thinking about kitchen table issues like the economy uh, or, or the border, for example. Does news like this, the attention it's getting in the media, the grabbing of, of the headlines actually impact voter sentiment, make them more likely to want to hear what the commander in chief or potential second in command, I guess you could say to the commander in chief uh, would want to say? on these issues? Yeah, news travels very quickly through these cycles. And even though yesterday we spent virtually the entire day talking about the impact that the uh, Hurricane Helene was going to have on mm -hmm. states like North Carolina and Georgia, today the entire media coverage seems to be laser focused on the attacks from Iran onto Israel. And so uh, yeah, voters, they, they, they're like us, right? They're consumers. And so they're looking at this saying, I want to know more about what's going on here. What's interesting about this is Kamala Harris comes in in most recent polls doing very well as commander in chief. In fact, a uh, few I've seen recently, public polls, they have indicated that she has a slight advantage over 
Donald Trump, a former commander in chief. And so this is a very high uh, high wire act for the current administration. They got to get this right. Uh, and I think the, the, the ground that they are on now, which is safe, is we're defending Israel at all costs. And I think that that, that could be an advantage for her. And it just depends tonight on how her vice presidential nominee, Tim Walz, handles it. A couple of important headlines from the IDF. First, a spokesman saying there are no known injuries uh, from the Iran missile launches, which is pretty remarkable considering we're talking about more than 100 of them. Uh, Also, from the Israeli military, this attack was serious and will have consequences. Jeannie implying that this test will not just be done today. That's that's right. I mean, I think what we are all bracing for is a retaliation by Israel. We know, of course, this was an retaliation, retaliation rather by Iran. We expect Israel to hit back. We remember after April, they were more contained in the way they responded. And we have to wait and see what they're going to do. But this is going to be a big concern for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris sitting there in the Situation Room, I'm sure, in direct contact with um, the IDF and, and the leaders of Israel um, to try to see if they could do anything to de-escalate this situation at this point. That's been their watchword as it pertains to the Middle East of late, but very hard to see how they achieve that. And so that leaves them in a very difficult situation vis-a-vis their Middle Eastern policy. All right, Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis, our signature political panel, Bloomberg Politics contributors, thank you for joining us this hour. And of course, we'll have much more with Rick and Jeannie in the later edition of Balance of Power at 5 p.m. and in our special coverage of the VP debate, which will be simulcast on Bloomberg. That special coverage beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern time here on Bloomberg TV and radio. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.